Hi guys, so welcome back. Uh, this is Queen Stage, and uh, I'm Lucas here. Back to you. Uh, you can see David Ostrovsky already on the screen. Hi, David. Hello. Hey, uh, we were just chatting with David. He's connecting from Israel. He's going to have a presentation in just in a few moments, uh, and I want to present him shortly because uh, he has a really great uh, kind of a story about him in his bio. So I'm just going to go through it. Uh, at age nine, uh, little David found a book in Russian called Electronic Computational Machines at the library and, after reading it in a single weekend, decided that this is what he wants to do with his life. Three years later, he finally got to touch a computer for the first time and discovered that it was totally worth the wait. One thing led to another and now he's an architect at a software company, Proofpoint. David is a software developer with over 20 years of industry experience. He's a speaker, he's a trainer, he's a blogger, and a co-author of Pro Couchbase Server. Uh, he specializes in large-scale distributed system architecture. Uh, the, name, the talk is called From Synchronous to Asynchronous Distributed Microservices. So, are you ready, uh, yeah. David? Absolutely. Yeah. So, okay, uh, the stage is yours. We are listening. Uh, we are we are there at the other side of the screen. So, there you go. Good luck. All right. Thank you very much. And everybody, uh, like uh, like we said, I'm David. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, asynchronous distributed systems today. And when I say asynchronous, um, let me actually explain what that is. Um, something can be asynchronous in and of itself, right? So, uh, usually processes or components are asynchronous with respect to each other. Uh, so, just a simple example would be, uh, I go to order a coffee and if I talk to the uh, barista, uh, I might just wait in front of them while they make the coffee and then get the coffee back, which would be a synchronous process because I'm blocking the entire queue and everyone's waiting behind me. Or I could just, you know, hand in my order get a ticket and then go somewhere else and when the order is ready they'll call me back and i'll pick up my coffee which will be an example of an asynchronous process and obviously they scale differently and you know from there we can uh, pretty much get the gist of the talk and expand from there and so uh, in in software development right asynchronous systems are obviously very well known i'm sure uh, everyone listening uh, has dealt with those especially now that we have a lot of microservices we have you know three or four different talks at this conference alone about how do you create microservices, how do you decompile monoliths into microservices and so on. Um, and generally when we build same systems with a lot of services, we start out building them with synchronous dependencies, right? So service A calls service B and service B goes and does something else and then returns a response to service A while service A is waiting for that response, right? And those services are very straightforward. They're easy to think about, they're easy to design. They have a lot of advantages, you know, the simplicity and uh, the error handling is much more straightforward because if some service down the chain of calls throws an exception or an error, that error gets propagated all the way up the stack and you can catch it and handle it somewhere, right? And so uh, they're actually a very good model for a lot of different systems, uh, but at a certain point, we start finding the edges of what's actually easy to do or possible to do with synchronous microservices with synchronous dependencies, right? And that's generally where we start considering whether it's time to switch our uh, message passing or our uh, service architecture to something more asynchronous that handles message passing and queues and uh, message logs and so on. Um, and once we actually start looking into more asynchronous modes of communication, uh, the, a lot of the benefits that we get from that are around breaking up temporal coupling, which means uh, different components don't depend on all of them working at the same time. Uh, so we get failure modes that move from outright failures because one service broke and so the entire chain of services breaks to something that where one service might be uh, affected, but all the others around it can still continue working. And so the whole system is more resilient and more available as a result of that. And this is something that's been uh, getting more and more important in the industry, right? the, the, the reliability engineering aspect of it. Uh, as an example, we have, I think, three or four different talks at, just at this conference about chaos engineering and reliability engineering, stuff like that. And as a trend, it's uh, obviously very important in the industry, right? And so part of that engineering for reliability means uh, utilizing more asynchronous modes of communications between components in the system. Uh, and so uh, that obviously brings more complexity and the, the downside of moving to asynchronous systems is it's harder to debug, harder to actually see what's going on in the system, 
uh, errors might happen a long way away in, in time from where they originate, right? If I call a service asynchronously, uh, it might return an error five minutes later, and I don't actually have a context of why that error even happened in the first place. And so it, it becomes more complicated, but it does give us a lot more options in terms of making the system more re resilient and reliable, right? And so um, why do we do this? Like I said, temporal coupling is a big one, uh, breaking up temporal couplings between different components, uh, changing one failure mode to another, so changing outright failures into uh, more towards latency or partial failures, uh, and getting more options to deal with reactive systems, reactive systems being those that uh, instead of uh, propagating state, actually deal with propagating the change of state and, and uh, handle data flows. For example, I work at, at a company called Proofpoint, I lead architecture of our cloud security product, products, and our main cloud security product what it does is it gathers uh, audit data from all these various public clouds like Google Drive and, and OneDrive and, and Salesforce, and it brings in uh, billions of different audit events from different cloud providers, which we need to analyze and, and do a bunch of heuristics on to discover if it's legitimate user activity or some kind of malicious activity that's almost you know, broken to the account of our customer that's trying to do some fraud or uh, something, right? exploitate data. And Doing a list requires moving a lot of data from point to point, doing a lot of different kinds of processing on it, and all of those things lend themselves really well to asynchronous uh, processing. So let's take a small example, a very straightforward example uh, of the difference between a, a consistent and uh, synchronous service model to a asynchronous service. Let's imagine we have a very simple client application. We have some kind of client, maybe an application or a web front end, which calls a service on the back end, and the service stores some record or some object in the database, right? Very straightforward scenario. So in a synchronous model, uh, it will be something like uh, I press a save button on my web form and the uh, web code calls the service and the service uh, blocks on the call and calls the database and then stores this in a database and it waits until the database finishes everything, everything is persisted, the database returns the call to the service, the service returns the call to the client, everything is uh, completely synchronous and so if there is in fact an error then uh, you know we'll get the result in the ui immediately but while we're waiting for the whole process to finish obviously the user experience is blocked the user can't you know continue doing other stuff while they're waiting for this thing to happen whereas with an asynchronous model what's actually going to happen is um, the application is going to call the the service and the service will instead of calling the database directly will store this data in some magical buffer or other place, which we'll obviously talk about in just a bit, because it's not really magical, but for the, for the example, let's say that the service just puts this request to store data somewhere else, which waits for uh, the database to, to wake up, take the data and store it. And as far as the service is concerned, as soon as it's stored or buffered the request to store data in this magical transport, it's done, it succeeded, right? And so what happens if the database fails, right? So let's examine the failure scenario. Obviously, if it's a, if everything is successful, then the user experience is the same. I press the save button, everything saves immediately and everything comes back. But in a failure scenario, what happens is uh, in a synchronous set of services, if the database is down, then obviously the service that talks to it also presents as being unavailable, right? Because it returns an exception or an error from the database. Uh, whereas in a asynchronous service, the service isn't actually coupled to the state of the database. It stores the request to save data in that magical place we talked about. And that is buffered and saved for later. And so as far as the service is concerned, everything continues working, which means that from the point of view of the client, the synchronous system is in some indeterminate state, right? It might throw an error. It might, if the database isn't completely broken or but just, you know, lagging because it's overloaded, it might actually get stuck waiting forever for the database to respond. So the, the, experience from the point of view of the client, of the user, is that the system is unavailable, which is very bad. Uh, whereas from an asynchronous point of view, everything remains available, right? The downside, unfortunately, of course, is that uh, if we do save something in the synchronous model, uh, if I refresh the page, I will immediately get the latest version of the data from the database. Whereas with the asynchronous system, because I queue up my data storage, my data write, right? Uh, it might take a while to get persisted in the database. And so if I refresh the page quickly enough and try to retrieve the data that I know I just saved, uh, 
it might not be available or I might get an older version of that data. Which brings us to the really the, the crux of this trade off, the main trade off you know, when we're talking about synchronous versus asynchronous system, which is a trade off between consistency of the system against availability of the system, right? Either we have a consistent view of data throughout the entire system, but we pay for it by having the system be unavailable if any one component along the way is broken, uh, versus a system which is much more available, or you know, we always get a response more operations will generally succeed, but they won't be consistent all, all the time. In the case of failures, we might end up having uh, a latency between when we actually queue up an operation to when it actually succeeds. And so that's the really the core trade-off. Uh, and it's a well-known trade-off in, uh, in the realm of databases, right? Anyone who's worked with distributed databases is probably familiar with the CAP theorem. Uh, and the CAP theorem is generally applied to distributed databases specifically, but we can generalize it from it to microservices and distributed systems, right? So the CAP theorem is, is a conjecture that was uh, proposed by a computer scientist named Eric Brewer uh, from Berkeley uh, in 1998. And then uh, a few years later, a team from MIT actually formally proved that it is correct, thus it became a theorem. And what it says is that a distributed data store or in our case, let's generalize to a distributed set of microservices, uh, can simultaneously provide at most two of these three guarantees. Uh, consistency, which as we talked about, is that every read receives the most recent uh, version of the written data or an error, um, or availability, which is exactly as we talked about earlier, right? Every request actually receives a non-error response. So the system never presents an error uh, on every request, even if some parts of it are unavailable or down, uh, and partition tolerance, which is the ability of the system to continue functioning normally despite losing messages between nodes of the system, so between services or between databases and so on. All right, and if we, if we generalize uh, from that to uh, microservices, it's exactly what we talked about. We cannot give up partition tolerance because a system which doesn't have partition tolerance built in is just not going to be a useful system, right? If you, if the system stops working, uh, if there's no, because of network latency or packet loss, it's just not a system you, you want to have in production. And so practically, the real trade-off we are presented with is do we want consistency or we want do we want availability because we always want the partition tolerance. By the way, just because it says at most two out of, uh, out of three doesn't mean you always get all two, right? You might actually have none of those or, or just one, just partition tolerance or just consistency. Uh, it is only at most. And again, the, the at the same time part is very important because a system can have both consistency and availability just at different times. So let's, let's look at a very common example. You, usually at this point, I, I do a survey with you know, raising hands, but unfortunately in this format, I can see you guys, you can see me and I can raise my hand, but it's, it's not helpful for a survey. Uh, but let, let me let me give you the example, right? I'm sure everyone is familiar with bank machines, right? You go to a bank, they're, you know, up, go, walk to, up to a wall and there's an ATM. And let's say I have a hundred currency in my account. And I see three bank machines on the wall and I go to the first machine, I put on my card, I withdraw a hundred currency. Uh, and then I go to a second machine and I try to withdraw a hundred currency again. Uh, and what's, what's supposed to happen, right? Obviously you can't answer unfortunately, but there's two things that might happen. Either A, it's a consistent system, which means that the first machine has already updated my bank account and I now have zero money in my account. And so the second machine is gonna tell me, no, you don't have any money or it's not a consistent system, which means it takes a while for the change to propagate. And so the, the uh, second machine is going to give me another hundred dollars or hundred whatever currency it is. Uh, and I'll end up with a minus hundred in my account once the system actually becomes consistent. Um, and let's talk about what happens in a failure mode in such a system, right? Uh, so let's say that this branch of the bank for some reason lo loses network connectivity with the mainframe of the bank where all the accounts are actually stored. So what do you think is going to happen? If I walk up to the bank machine and I try to withdraw a hundred monies from my account and the machine is actually not connected to the mainframe, is it going to give me my hundred monies or is it going to say, no, you don't, you, you know, error, you can't do anything. So basically what I'm asking is, do you think the bank decide, designed the ATM system to be AP available and partition tolerant or CP consistent and partition tolerant? Um, just take a second to think about that and counterintuitively, the answer is actually that it is AP. It's actually going, to, even though the bank machines can't communicate to the mainframe, uh, 
in most systems, they're actually going to give me money, even though they can't verify that I actually have the money in, in the account. And there's a few reasons for that. One is obviously user experience. The, the bank is interested in providing a good customer experience to me. I want to be able to, uh, to use the system and withdraw money and they can update my account uh, after the fact. Uh, and, and because most people can actually uh, withdraw money and they have enough uh, in their account. And also because it's actually in the bank's financial interest to allow me to overdraw my account. So if I go to all three bank machines and manage to get 100 money from each one of them, and I end up with minus 200 money in my account, the bank can then just charge high interest for the overdraft. Um, and so that, that is an example of a system which intuitively I would think should be consistent. You know, if you don't have money, you shouldn't be able to withdraw it. But in reality, it's actually designed to be available uh, within certain constraints, right? You can't withdraw a million dollars because the bank machine is going to block you. Um, so that, that's really the difference. And so uh, going back to that magical place I talked about where we store the command uh, between services, it's obviously not a mass, magical place. It's, uh, as most of you have probably surmised, it's some sort of message queue or a buffer or something where we can store messages uh, for some other component to later pick up and process the message. Uh, and usually it, it takes form of some kind of uh, message queue. I don't really like talking about specific technologies, but there's some easy examples I'm sure most of you have heard about you know, RabbitMQ or Kafka or other, or other types of queues. Um, and really the, the main requirement we have from those systems is that they be reliable and robust, right? Because um, if we now relax the requirement of the whole system to be consistent, we need at least something, at least the message transport itself to be reliable. If I post a message to the transport, I need to get an acknowledgement from the transport saying, yes, the message was stored uh, you know, successfully and persisted and is durable. And then later some other component can pick up the message and process it, right? If my transport is not reliable, that means that there is a possibility of data loss, which actually is okay in some types of system. In some asynchronous system, data loss is acceptable. Think about, for example, this stream, right? You're getting video. If you have a network uh, problem right now uh, with your internet, you're gonna lose a few frames, but then it will skip forward and you know uh, catch up to the latest frame. This is obviously a lossy system. It's asynchronous because you're streaming uh, frames from the you know, from Skype or whatever server it is to your uh, machine, and it's actually okay to have some data loss because you're mostly interested in the latest snapshot of the data and not the entire data set. Uh, in most systems we deal with, uh, in, you know, in, in IT, that's not actually the case. It's not actually acceptable to lose a bunch of data. Uh, and so different types of message transport are optimized for different needs in this case. Um, and so once we have this message transport, right, and for example, again, at Proofpoint, the, the product I'm mostly uh, uh, working on, we use Kafka very heavily. Uh, pretty much everything we do is data processing. And we have in the Proofpoint cloud access uh, security system, we have I'd say 80, 90-ish services which talk to each other and do various types of processing. Uh, and of those services, I think only three have synchronous interfaces between them. One of them is the web uh, backend, because obviously you can't not have a synchronous uh, web backend, right? Because the, the web application front end talks to the backend, it gets a query, it needs to get the data, and that is a synchronous call. And we'll talk about uh, read versus write path a little bit later when we talk about more advanced uh, message patterns. Uh, but generally, uh, the, the UI is going to be synchronous because it reads data and wants to present it, present it. And so the UI obviously depends synchronously for reading data. But a, almost every service which writes data is implemented asynchronously. So it can post a message to Kafka in our case, or whatever it is you want to use, you know, some cloud services or some other queue. Um, and then some other service picks up the message later. Um, and so with those, we can have some uh, common patterns, which let you actually uh, get a good idea of how to combine services together, right? And so the most common pattern, which is uh, the one we use most, is fire and forget or notification, where a service wants to send uh, some data or some message to a different service, or just you know has some output to produce, and that service posts the message to your message transport, to, you know, to Kafka, to RabbitMQ, to whatever it is. It doesn't respect, expect a response from another service, right? It doesn't actually know where it's sending. It has data to produce. It produces it to the message transport, and then it's done. It's fire and forget, just like the UDP protocol on, you know, in, in, uh, versus TCP or any, any, uh, any other protocol that doesn't actually expect a response. Uh, 
It does, however, uh, in a durable uh, mass transport, res expect a response from the transport itself. Right. So if you think how a, a, a queue client works, it posts a message to the queue. It waits for the queue to acknowledge that the message has been persisted. It doesn't wait for somebody to pick up the message from the other side of the queue and send you a response. Right. And that's that's a crucial difference. Uh, and the reason why it's actually acceptable uh, to say, yeah, that system is reliable, even though we are synchronously dependent on the message transport is because we can put a lot of effort into making the message transport itself very reliable. That's why most of the common technologies for message uh, passing, you know, like queues like Kafka and uh, Kinesis and SQS, they're very robust. They're designed from the ground up to have you know large replication factors and work you know, across regions or across data centers. And so you can put a lot of effort into making that system robust, and that gives you a lot of leeway in not having to make every single system in, uh, in your architecture as robust as that, because then you can rely on the message transport to buffer in case of failures. All right. So from the fire and forget, we go uh, to a slightly uh, the, the next evolution from fire and forget is the message uh, publisher and subscriber, which again I'm sure most of you have uh, deal, dealt with, whether it's you know in, uh, within the process or between processes. Uh, the most uh, commonly used pub sub uh, would be something like RabbitMQ or Redis has a very uh, well-known pub sub mechanism, and it's it's almost the same as fire and forget. The difference is uh, a service publishes or multiple services can publish a message. The the publishers and the subscribers can be any number of subscribers can pick up the message. And this this pattern comes in in one of two flavors. There is the transient and the uh, durable. Transient means that we don't actually store the messages in the transport. We send the message, and if all the subscribers who are currently listening to the message will get it. But if a new subscriber joins after the message was posted, it's not going to get a historical message. It's only getting the messages from that point later. And so the messages are actually transient. Whereas with durable messages, if a publisher isn't listening, sorry, if a subscriber isn't listening just right now when they post a message, or maybe joins later, or if it's offline and reconnects or something like that, it will still get messages that it missed because they're stored durably for some amount of time. Right or until a certain number of messages, and so again we can talk about whether every subscriber gets the same message or you know they steal from each other. There's a bunch of depth in there. Uh, there's actually a very interesting talk coming up tomorrow uh, about uh, asynchronous message patterns uh, by Jimmy Bogart, uh, who is an excellent speaker. I strongly recommend everybody who's interested in this talk. You should also uh, go listen to his talk tomorrow. He's going to go into a lot more depth about you know asynchronous patterns and message passing. Uh, I'm kind of skipping over them because I want to talk about the architecture in general. Um, so yeah, I, I strongly recommend going to his talk as well. And so, like I said, publisher subscriber is the next evolution of the uh, fire and forget. And if we take two uh, directions of the fire and forget pattern, we get to the request response, right? Which is service A sends something to, to the message transport and service B picks it up, processes the message and then sends back a response to service A in the same manner. So essentially, this is just too far and forgets, right? Uh, this is the closest analog we have to the synchronous world with something like HTTP or gRPC, where in HTTP, I make a request from service A to service B, I wait for the response, and I get the response back. The biggest difference between synchronous and asynchronous request response is with synchronous mechanisms, service A retains the context of the request. Let's say I have something. Uh, well, let's take a very common example. Uh, in our system, in Proofpoint Casby, uh, we have a very common operation, we talk, what we call enrichment. Uh, imagine that we get uh, various audit events coming in from the cloud providers. For example, we look at events where a user uploads a file. And so we get an event saying user A, and we get the ID of the user, uploaded the file, we get the ID of the file uh, from such an IP. And then we need to analyze this, uh, this event and determine whether it's a legitimate user activity or if it's a malicious activity, someone uploaded the virus, right? And so all we have on the event itself is the ID of the user, ID of the file, and IP address of where that happened, plus some other stuff. And we need to take each one of those and enrich those or exp expand those with the details. We wanna to go to the system which stores users and bring in the entire user data and append to the message. We wanna to go to the system which stores metadata about files, get all the data about the file we know. We're going to go to a third system uh, which uh, stores threat intelligence about IP addresses and get everything we know about this IP address. You know, maybe it's a Tor exit node or a VPN or a known spammer or something, right? Uh, and so we want to get all of these pieces of data and enrich the event and expand it and then send it downstream to a different service 
to do something, right? To do some machine learning stuff on it and determine if it's a malicious activity, right? So this is a very, very straightforward um, enrichment, which is a type of uh, request response uh, pattern. So our service A gets this object with IDs. It calls service B, which, for example, is the user database or user management system, and gets a response with the user object, and it appends it to the to the uh, to the object. And so let's compare how that would work with either synchronous or asynchronous modes. And in our in the earliest iteration of our system, that was like three years ago when I just joined Proofpoint, all of this stuff was synchronous, right? All of this flow, we'd get an event, we would do all the enrichments synchronously, we would do all the processing synchronously, and eventually write a bunch of data out, and then we'd be done with this event. Um, and that was a very brittle system. It failed a lot, right? It was actually very simple. That's why it was the first iteration. It was very straightforward to write. It was very easy to debug because we could see where, where the failures happened. But when we put it in production at a large enough scale, it was extremely brittle and not reliable, which is a massive problem for us because we need to deal with you know, billions of these events every day. And so over time, we slowly, first of all, broke apart this monolith into a bunch of services. And then over even more time, we broke apart the dependencies between the services and moved them from synchronous to asynchronous dependencies. So this enrichment, instead of a service you know, calling into a different service via HTTP, getting a response and appending it, appending it uh, what happens is it now posts a message to the uh, user management system saying we have this ID, uh, you know, get your data and attach it and then send the message back. And so yes, this costs us more because we have multiple trips between different services with an ever expanding object. But that means that if the user database currently is overloaded because we're in uh, the highest uh, load during the day and there's a spike in load all of a sudden of user activity, even though the database is overloaded, what happens is the queue uh, at the entrance to that service grows and, and you know, uh, grows until uh, the spike actually ends. And then eventually the service will catch up and finish enriching all the objects and send all the responses back. And so this way we convert a, a failure condition from an outright failure where we just don't process the event at all into an eventual success. You know, we create lag, which is bad, obviously, because we want to process data as fast as possible and you know, stop threats quickly. But obviously, it's much better to eventually process the event than just fail to do it completely. Right? And th this is why we actually moved towards this response. This is really the, the core of why I, I feel very strongly about asynchronous systems. Right? And so in this pattern, going back to the slide, um, service A is not just one single instance. You know, we have 100 uh, containers running all copies of service A. And same thing with service B. We have you know, 100 containers running the instances of service B. And so what happens is instance one of service A sends a message, and then the response comes back asynchronously through a transport, and a completely different copy of service A picks up the response. Um, unlike with a synchronous mechanism where the same instance of service A gets the request and the response and still has their data in memory. And so in the asynchronous world, we actually have to take the context of the request and store it somewhere else. We either need to put it in a database on the side, or we need to attach it to the message itself so that when the response comes back, we get all of the context of what your message originated plus the extra data in the response, right? And that's a big difference. And it's important to remember that this is uh, the request response in, in asynchronous services works very different, in fact, from synchronous, right? And, we, and if we take this concept of, uh, of um, uh, pub subs and the request response services and expand it even further, we get to distributed message logs. And distributed message logs, uh, the, the most famous one, a well-known one, obviously, is Apache Kafka. Uh, or and there's a bunch more Kinesis and Pulsar and, and every cloud provider has their own flavor. Um, it takes the same idea of a, uh, a pub sub uh, mes uh, message queue, but it adds history to it, which means that every consumer can consume the message log from any point. Right? It doesn't need to get the latest uh, uh, the latest message. It can go back to the beginning of history and consume all the messages that were ever written up until it catches up to the current point which is a extremely powerful ability because it lets us do something things like let's say that we have an algorithm that processes something right a machine learning algorithm which we trained uh, and it takes uh, events and evaluates them based on you know, whether they're good or bad and generates alerts uh, and so we go and we, when we develop a new generation of this algorithm we train a new model and now we want to replace it uh, in production now, obviously, what we can do is we can, you know, take down the old service, bring in the new service, and then from that point onward, we will find better results with the service. 
But what, what if we actually want to go back to the beginning of history and reevaluate everything that happened with this new model, because it's much better. We maybe we missed something with the old model. So what we can do is we can bring up a, a separate copy side by side with the old one that's now running the new algorithm with a new model. And we can point it to the beginning of the queue or beginning of the log and process all the messages until this service catches up to the current state and only then bring down the old version of the service. And this way we can seamlessly, without any downtime, switch from one version of our algorithm to the other and also keep up with the entire history of everything we've ever seen or in, until uh, at least going all the way back to the retention period, right? That, that, uh, that's a very powerful ability, right? And so if we take all of these uh, very straightforward patterns of message passing, from there we can extrapolate to more complex patterns. And the really the, the one of the most important, pat important patterns in common IT applications is CQRS, which is Command Query Responsibility Segregation. And it's a big name, and I'm sure most of you have heard of it, uh, but I'll just I'll quickly summarize what it talks about is separating the read model and the read path in the system from the write model and the write path in the system, right? And, and I touched on this earlier when I was talking about the UI and why most uh, services that drive the UI end up being synchronous because the UI runs queries and wants to get data to present and it wants to get data in a specific format or what we normally call a read model, right? Which might be very different from the way data actually enters the system. Um, and trying to combine the read model, which is optimized for quick retrievals for the uh, for the UI or for the client, and combine that with the write model, which is optimized for quickly updating pieces of your uh, of your object, is, actually, is often very cumbersome and, and it's usually quite um, uh, quite bad for performance of reads and writes, because it's very hard to optimize for both reads and writes within the same system in data store. And so with CQRS, we separate those models. So as a straightforward example, let's say we have an entity that we manage, and this entity has two properties. Uh, it says a property named color and temperature, right? Um, and so in CQRS, rather than just issuing simple CRUD commands, you know, take entity and, and you know, insert into database or update database where entity equals A and color equals B, uh, what we will do is on the right path, we will send a command. And the command in CQRS is generally meant to be not just a CRUD command, which is, you know, update the entity, but something that's more domain logic specific. For example, uh, we'll have a command called make the entity awesome, right? And this is obviously a very contextual command. It only makes sense within the domain logic of our service. And so our service can take this command from the message queue and it can interpret it in, as, okay, so uh, it needs to split this command into several, several write operations. It will go and update the color to pink and it will update the temperature property to 1000 and so the entity will become uh, hot and pink, which is an awesome entity, right? Uh, and so the read model for that might be, instead of having all of these separate entities and then joining them, we will join the color entity with the temperature entity with the user and other bunch of them, create one large object and cache it in some other service. And that will become our read model, which is pretty much what we're looking at in the slide, right? And so the query to show the stuff in the UI will read from the read model our commands will update the right model. And there is something which is not in the slide, right? But there's some magic which takes the right model and you know, whenever it changes, it goes and generates a new read model for each one of those, right? And so this pattern, it's, it's extremely common in, uh, in complex uh, systems. Uh, and oftentimes when we talk about it, we tend to combine it with event sourcing. Um, if you go to read, read any blogs or any, any material about uh, CQRS, it will eventually inevitably mention event sourcing. Those two are not the same, right? They, they often, it's often convenient to implement one and the other together in the same system, but they're different patterns. Event sourcing is uh, this idea of storing the full log of, log of operations or events that have happened until now. All right, as, as a very straightforward example, the classic examples, right, um, is a shopping cart, right? I go to Amazon or somewhere and I start adding stuff to my shopping cart. And then eventually I realize that I've spent my entire salary on Amazon and I'll say, okay, no, I'll delete some stuff. And I go and I delete half the things I entered in my shopping cart. And then I only spent half my salary on, on, on Amazon. Um, but in, if you look, think about Amazon, what they care about is not just what's in my shopping cart when I you know, go to checkout. They do want to know all the things that I've ever expressed any interest in, 
so they can you know, send ads to me and ad advertise those things because maybe I'll buy them in the future. And so if you think about the shopping cart entity, uh, while I'm in my session, while I'm browsing Amazon, uh, I add stuff to it, I remove stuff to it. And if we only saved the current state, the snapshot of what's currently in, this, in, the, in the cart, we lose all of this important context of what I ever touched. Right. And so if you think about uh, the shopping cart as instead of a snapshot as a sequence of events, uh, we can actually record it as a log of events saying, add this to the shopping cart, remove that from the shopping cart, add another thing, remove another thing. If we take all of these events and we coalesce them, we can collapse them into the current state. Right? Same as the example we see on the slide, which is you know, we have two different entities, A and B, and we can do some math on them. We can add one, we can add two to B, we can add five. And so we can materialize or coalesce those into the current snapshot. So the value of A would be 19 and the value of B is minus five if we do the entire series. But if we store all of the changes, we can now do interesting things like go back and say, what was the value of A two days ago? You know, what were ever any of the values of A? Uh, what was, uh, you know, uh, let's say if we lose the snapshot, we lose the database, we can now restore the entire database by going back in time and running all of the events from the source and materializing them into a new snapshot. Now, if we, now if we connect that to the idea of uh, CQRS, this is one way of actually generating your read model, right? Your write commands would be the events coming in and the sourced events. And then your read model would be the current snapshot of the materialized state of all of those events, right? And so it's very easy to get the current uh, value of A, uh, but if we need to, we can go back and get all the values that A has ever had, right? Uh, and so with those two patterns, we can actually start building much more complex systems. Uh, in as an example, in the system that I uh, I own, we have we use all of those very extensively, right? Because again, it's a very data event-driven system. We get a bunch of events coming in. A lot of the time, components fail, databases can fail, uh, networks can disconnect, and there can be all kinds of chaos. And so it's very convenient that we have all of the events we've ever seen stored in message logs, because we can then just drop a, a materialized snapshot and then regenerate all of it from source and very quickly recover from errors or from failures, or even just change the entire algorithm of what we do and go regenerate all of the data with a new algorithm. Right. Um, and so going back to what I was talking about uh, with the transport, um, saying that this transport is reliable is not uh, very uh, is, is not very precise, right? There are different levels of guarantees of reliability in our message transport, uh, and the the most common and the simplest one to do, to do, to guarantee is what's called at most once, which means if I send a message, the receiver will see it at most once, which implies it might see it zero times, right? So a lot of the fire and forget systems, for example, like UDP, like the stream, they guarantee at most once delivery, right? You're never gonna see the video frame more than once, but you might skip a few frames and see them zero times. Now, this is useful in those kind of systems where the latest, uh, latest message is the most important, but obviously for common systems, that's not a good enough uh, guarantee. And so we, from there, we can get to a slightly higher guarantee, which is called at least once, which means that the receiver is guaranteed to get the message at least once, but in case of failures, it might have to roll back and get the same message more than once. And so those kind of systems usually end up having to be idempotent, which means if you have to design them in a way that if you receive a message more than once, you need to be able to deal with them. So um, either making updates uh, idempotent or maybe storing a snapshot or something like that. Uh, and the hardest guarantee to deliver uh, is called exactly once, which means that if you have two systems communicating, two components communicating, uh, anytime a message is sent, it will be received only exactly once, no more, no less. This is kind of like the golden unicorn of computing. It's almost impossible to achieve. In very specific cases, it is possible. For example, in newer versions of Kafka, you can actually read from one Kafka topic and post to another Kafka topic after processing the message. And because it's within the same Kafka cluster, you can have sort of a transaction which acknowledges the read message and produces the output message at the same time. And so if you fail to produce the output, you also don't acknowledge the input. But those are very specific cases. And as soon as you have side effects, which means let's say the service that processes the message also updates a, data, a database or maybe you know, uses some kind of input, uh, then exactly one stops being possible uh, because you now have a side effect which uh, might not be important. So you might actually not be able to, do, to, to guarantee that the side effect can also be rolled back. Maybe. 
Uh, and so uh, that's a very hard guarantee to deliver. The other very hard guarantee to deliver, of course, is ordering of messages. Ordering of messages is something we'll talk about in just a bit when we talk about error handling. Uh, but generally, uh, it is best to assume that for most types of message transport, you will get messages out of order. It's, it's, a, it's a very dangerous thing to rely on the order of messages being exactly as we posted them. Now, before we talk about that and error handling, I need to quickly mention transactions. I'm not going to go into transactions because it's a huge topic. It's a whole, uh, it's a whole talk in and of itself. And Jimmy Bogart is actually going to talk about transactions and sagas tomorrow. So if you want to talk about distributed transactions, go to his talk. It's very cool. If you don't want to go there, uh, this is just you know, to give you an idea. You might want to go and Google sagas and compensatory transactions and learn about this. because It's a very interesting uh, subject, which we really can't expand into in, you know, in a single talk. Uh, bro broadly speaking, um, this, uh, this is just to give you an idea of how many different messages, uh, message technologies there are. There are hundreds of them, but the most popular ones I'm sure most of you have heard about, which is you know, Kafka and RabbitMQ uh, and the uh, cloud specific ones. Um, so going back to error handling and back pressure, there's two things we want to talk about just before we finish uh, this, uh, this presentation, which is back pressure and error handling. Back pressure is when one component on the receiving end is overloaded how do we make sure that, uh, how do we tell the producer of messages to stop overloading it? And we have two choices to make here. It's, it's a trade-off and we'll see in a second that the same trade-off we talked about at the start of the talk, which is consistency versus availability. Uh, if we have some kind of throttling, because you know, if service A is loaded, it will tell service, uh, service B is overloaded and can protest messages, it can tell service A to slow down. However, if we do that, that means there is a runtime uh, coupling between service B and service A, which puts us right back into the synchronous model. So as soon as we have throttling from a consumer to, uh, to the producer, we stop being fully decoupled in asynchronous. If we don't implement flow control, which means that service B might be unavailable, but in transport, we'll continue queuing up data as it comes in up to a certain limit, because obviously it can't grow infinitely. Um, and then when service B comes back, then we, it can catch up uh, that's a much better model in terms of reliability, but again, obviously it has the danger, danger of if service B doesn't come back, your queue will eventually explode and also fail, right? And so this is a strong trade-off and it's basically the same thing as we talk about with consistency and availability. And with error handling, um, it's again, there's, it's the same trade-off, right? Except in this case, we can trade off in order delivery versus out of order delivery and availability. Because if you have a message queue and it has a bunch of messages, and let's say that there is a message somewhere in the middle of the queue, which you fail to process. And so there you have two choices, or three really. One, you can throw out the message, which is data loss, and then you, know, it's, you might be okay in, in some cases, but for most applications, it's not acceptable. The other choice is we can keep retrying to process the message infinitely, and which means that the service is now stuck on this message, it's not continuing processing other messages, but then it will guarantee that if we eventually manage to process it, we'll process all the messages. And so we get uh, full results from that. But of course, if the message is completely broken, let's say it's, it's in a bad format, there's no point trying to retry it. And so here we need to actually examine what type of error and according to which kind of error, either retry or throw out the message into some kind of dead letter queue. And the last option, um, the last option is to retry out of order, which means take the message out of the queue, put it somewhere else, continue processing the queue, and then get the message eventually and try it again later, right? And so um, that's pretty much it. Um, just to summarize, we talked a lot about message queues and error handling, and all we, all with all the things we talked about ultimately end up in this main trade-off of do we want a system that's consistent and synchronous and easy to debug, or do we want a system that is uh, more reliable, but obviously much harder to manage and uh, control? Right.